Hi, I've been working on something for a little bit since I've had some conversation with prospects and uh, one client in particular. And it got me on this road of uh, trying to show the, uh, the influence of uh, fees on qualified plans and what those taxes will be um, at some point, right? Uh, we know what they are today, uh, but we don't know what they'll be in the future. And uh, so this, this conversation um, was that he was thinking about taking, let's just say at the time, 500,000 out of uh, qualified plans as IRAs and 401ks. And during the discussion, he said to me, do you have any idea how painful this is? And um, I said, I do have an idea. And just the thought of taking that out, he's 49 years old. Uh, he'll also be hit with the 10% penalty on top of taxes because of course these were not Roth products. So they were pre-taxed. So when he pulls it, distributes it, um, it'll be taxed. And um, it, then he said, I just can't stomach giving them any more money. And uh, I didn't say it in such a nice way, but I was very strong about it. I just, but, but also understanding. I just said, the truth is that's water under the bridge, right? I said it, like I said, in different, a different way, but um, it is water under the bridge anyone who's entered into a qualified plan, IRA, 401k, they've entered into a contract with the government forward slash IRS. And um, they're going to share in whatever happens to the account balance, okay? They're your partner um, that just basically sits on the sidelines and says, uh, you want some of your money? Well, I'm going to take a certain percentage of it. And today we know what that percentage is because we know what our tax rates are, our income tax rates are. Uh, that can all be figured out, right, through brackets and, and tax um, rates. But what we don't know is what they could be in the future. So you have to take the hit at some point. It's not all your money when you get a statement or you look online and you look at the balance. You know, it would be honest of them to know what your income is, know what the tax rates are today, and tell you that if you were to distribute this money today, this is what your account balance would be, including uh, what state you live in, and if you happen to have a state income tax, they should be calculating all of that because that is exactly what would happen. It would become income as it gets distributed and it would, it would be painful, but the pain is going to go away. The pain, if there's pain today, taxes likely aren't going to go down and the pain won't become less. So, you know, I get it because I've distributed 401ks and IRAs. I've paid the penalty of being under 59 and a half. I've paid, you know, my taxes. Uh, and that is, that is painful. But that's the game that we entered into. We didn't know it. We weren't completely aware of it. Maybe we thought it, but we didn't really say, oh, hey, this, this match might not be worth it because of, of the partner that I got into bed with, okay? So I wanted to lay that as the foundation. I'm gonna do a couple of things. I'm gonna show you what kind of numbers I was working with. I have a spreadsheet that I'd uh, like to share with you um, that's a calculator that can be used with any numbers that you input. So I'm gonna use certain numbers I could use numbers with you that are your numbers, what you feel comfortable with, and try to be honest about the projection because 
the financial industry talks about things that are really not um, complete uh, exposure to the truth. I just say that they're not, they're not lying necessarily. They're talking in terms that aren't the, the real numbers, okay? And there's many financial advisors that do what I do uh, that were and still are licensed to sell stocks, bonds, implement 401ks, IRAs, defined contribution, pension plans, um, all that kind of stuff. But they realized that after, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, that the numbers didn't play out for their clients. And they said, hey, what a, what's going on here? I, I need to find a better way. We all need to at least know there's another way, okay? So I don't know how much you're gonna be able to see this board. Um, I'm gonna try to give you the lay of the land of what, um, what I was talking about, but all right. So let me see if we can get this. Okay. So at the top, and I'm going to stand up. At the top here, I just said that it's qualified funds, IRA, 401k. You had the 500,000. Don't get caught up on this that you don't have it. I'll show you how we can build up to the 500 or at least what the alternatives are to putting it into the market. And then I used what they call the S&P Spider, which is an electronically traded fund, an ETF. It's a bucket of the S&P 500 stocks. And I took a 20 year period. Now you can say we can take a, a, a different period, right? Um, we could drop 2000 and add 2020 because we know what those numbers are. But what I did was I took, which you can find on the internet, is I took 2000 to 2019. Uh, I also showed what kind of return that there was in the market for 20 years was 5.96 compounded annual growth. We'll get you to that. Okay, so that's what we start with, but that doesn't include fees that they're taken out. And that does not include, obviously, the taxes when you have to pay it. But I'll get into that. So what I did was I did things in 10 year increments. I did 2000 to 2009. So 10 years there, then I did 2010 to 2019. And then I repeated like, I know we've already had, you know, 2020, but let's just say I tried to get a 40 year period here. So starting in 2020, I took what the returns were with this S&P um, 500 spider ETF and I, I rotated it again. So from 2020 to 2029, I used the, the first 10 years of the century. And then from 2030 to 2039, projecting out what these numbers would be, I used the second decade, decade of the century. So I had return, uh, rate of returns for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. We don't know what period everybody's in, or at least I don't know who's listening in, in, to this uh, presentation, but you know, you could be in a 30 year block, right? Um, because you've got to start streaming some of this income uh, is in retirement and so forth. Um, I also show you the rate of return effect of fees. Now fees, they're all over the place. Uh, in fact, many, you can't even find out what they're charging for fees. Uh, I had one of my clients texting me uh, within the past week, and he was on a company presentation um, about his 401k. So there was a representative there that was the custodian of the 401k. And my client uh, could chat. And there was another gentleman, uh, was not my client, but he, 
he also was chatting and they were trying to find out what the fees were. And this woman presenting uh, was not disclosing what they were. In fact, she said, well, the mutual funds charge fees, never alluded to the, she charges, her company charges fees, which of course the custodians making money doing this. So what are the fees that are coming out? And later on, he was upset that he didn't push it when he looked uh, at some chart that came up about compounded growth. And he wishes he had asked, hey, included in that compounded growth that you're making it look so good, does that include the fees? Uh, very evasive. It's hard to track down, but you'll find on the internet, there's a lot of discussion if you dig, you know, because it's, it's buried now. I, I used to be a little bit more accessible, but they'll talk, it could be anywhere from one to 4%. And so what I use though, trying to be conservative is one, one and a half and 2% and showing what the effect of those fees, which includes commissions, includes trading commissions, in asset management fees and so forth. I'm not saying I don't get paid off of commissions, but I can tell you there's a huge amount of money being taken from you through these fees and they're not even really that exposed. So then I did what the effect of, uh, in, in this particular gentleman's uh, situation, uh, he makes decent money. Um, at least according to the IRS. And so he's a little bit on the high end of the um, income tax brackets. So I use uh, what I did for him, but what those, uh, the effect of those income taxes are on the rate of return over a period of time, okay? So I'm gonna sit back down here and I just wanna share my screen, get my glasses back on. So a couple of things I want to show, right? So I'm an infinite banking practitioner for the Nelson Nash Institute out of Birmingham, Alabama. Those who've listened to some of my videos know that already. Um, so my focus is helping people create their own bank. As you can see, this is the title of our Nelson Nash's book. Um, this is the sixth edition. There is earlier editions that have his picture on the front. Um, but this is, I think, the latest version of the book. And it's called Unlocking the Infinite Banking Concept, which is what I practice with my clients and, and help guide them through uh, how they can use a permanent whole life insurance policy to build this capital pool that can be an emergency fund at its very basic level opportunity fund, finance the big things in life, um, you know, because so much of our money flows away from us through um, interest charges with mortgages that, you know, keep getting rolled over and refinanced. And there's all kinds of reasons because that's the only place you have any stored capital is in these places that the financial system gets involved in, right? But you want to build up your own capital pool and then always have access to it, allow it to continue to grow. Um, I, I came across a, an article today that showed up. Um, let me just see if I can scroll down here. It was written by a gentleman named Frank uh, Justra. Frank is um, he's a big investor a uh, big owner of private uh, companies and so forth. He's um, said to be a, a billionaire. Uh, but I just wanted to say that, you know, this is a great article. I'll put it in the um, notes portion on the YouTube video, a link to this story. It's not really anything new except for he talks historically and he talks about uh, the makeup of the people that are investing in the market. And, you know, it, it's the same old story that, you know, it seems like there's a new way of doing things and 
hey, we got this figured out this time um, and we won't be left holding the bag or standing without a chair when the music stops. So it's a great article. I just wanted to throw it up there. And then um, I wanted to get to the spreadsheet that um, I talked about, okay? So I'm gonna try to move myself out of the way a little bit. And then I'm gonna go to what I talked about from the beginning, which is, all right, we're gonna take, we're gonna take all the way to the left. I'm looking at year 2000. I'm looking at what the spider return, this electronically traded, basically mutual fund of the S&P based off of the S&P 500. And so interestingly enough, when people say, hey, well, if you're doing, you know, starting back at the beginning of the millennial, um, millennium, excuse me, you know, 2008 was in there. Well, 2008, you can see was, you know, in this column, annual rate of return was almost 37% down. But in uh, 2000, there was the dot-com bubble and the beginning of it. And then, you know, those first three years of the decade um, all started, uh, you know, negative. And so those first three years were even worse than 2008, but that was a tough decade, right? And so, what I've done here is show you, this is a 10 year tally. I add, you know, I've got a calculation here, right? So, you know, I got that number. You can see that it's 11.33% is, you know, but this divided by 10 years is 1.13%. And that's what people will tout is what the market averages, right? So the quick story about averages, Sorry, my glasses are reflecting there. The quick story about averages is take 100,000, for example, and okay, you put it in the market, the market goes up 50%. What do you have at the end of that first year? Well, you have 150,000. The next year, the market goes down 50%, right? So you've had an up year of plus 50% in a down year of negative 50%, what's the average? Well, it's zero, right? But when you look at the fact that you had a, you went from 100 to 150,000, then you lost 50% of that, you went down to 75,000. So, you know, roughly you lost about 12 and a half percent a year. That would be the actual rate of return, which is what I'm trying to show here, right? I've got a calculation for that. So we can work through that. It was, it was under 1% for the, for the whole decade. That's, you know, it basically was flat. You know, whatever times went up, it was only making up for what it had lost. And so these things matter. I can go to the left, I mean, to the right, but I'm gonna go down and I'm just gonna show you what I've done here. So then the next decade was all positive, um, except for 2018, slightly down. I say slightly, but okay. So these are the totals. This is what it all comes out to. And then I repeat, these numbers will look the same as above. Then I did the tally of all 30 years, right? So 30 year return, divide that, you get an average. But these are the real rates of return. This is not with fees though. I haven't shown you that yet. It is on the screen a little bit, but I haven't shown it to you. Then I repeated that second decade of the 2000s and the total 40 year return was 303 divided by 40, you're at an average of 7.58, but the real return was 5.96. Um, and so that's what I wanted to show you is when you get to you know the end of 40 years, right? You've got 
looks like a lot of money if you started with 500,000, for example, right? Oops, sorry here, just open that up a little bit. And so I wanna scroll back up and I wanna show you that what I was able to do is I took the 9% that first year was down. So this would be your end of year account balance, 454. But if you took out a 1% fee, you'd be at under the 450. And then you'd have to take that number, right? Um, and say, that's, that's the real number that I'm starting with, right? So then I'm down 11.5% or you know, a little bit above that, right? So this is what I end up with. Right, this is the actual end of year balance, not this number anymore. And so I'm taking 1% off of that. And I do that across the board for 1%, you know, uh, one and a half and 2%. So in this first decade, I'm no longer down just 1%, I'm down 2%. And, you know, I did go on to show that if you had a 35% tax bracket, you technically, if you needed that money at the end of those 10 years, you just lost over 6% of the money. But it's not just the percentages. What you lost was the difference between, you know, um, is between this 147,000 is really the difference between this number and this number, right? So you really did have this, this return, right? At the end of the year, but then you had the fees, then you had the taxes and your rate was this, but you lost $147,000 because of that 1% fee. And so that's money that's not going to flow to you because it's flowing to the government, right? It's flowing to the management companies of uh, the brokerage houses and so forth. So wanted to show that. Then, you know, if you went to one and a half percent, this is just in the first decade. Now you, you're seeing you keep losing, you know? So you need to know what these fees are. When I was talking to my client, he says, that's what I got to find out. I really got to understand what my fees are. I'm not paying attention to those. Um, I don't even know what they are. And he was, you know, he shouldn't be embarrassed. I mean, any, most of us don't know the answer to those questions. So I just kept showing, you know, what, what you actually lost in cash, but these are the rates. So let's scroll back again. And so we're looking at this uh, second decade and what are we, what is, whoops, sorry. What is actually happening here? Okay, so we have a better decade in the market, so to speak, right? So we're, we're up to, instead of 5.96%, well, we're down to 4.9 um, with this 1%. Uh, let's, we don't have to keep going on with these taxes, but you can see that this, these are the numbers and that's what you've lost. Um, not just this difference between the rates, that's cash flow that's gone. You, you're not going to touch that. And that's why these, these plans, even though like the market, you, you're watching stuff and you're saying, hey, everybody says the market's great why isn't my account balance growing? Uh, there's something amiss here, right? Well, this is some of it, right? You got to dig under the covers. So it, of course, it just keeps going down. And then I did this across the board. I'm going to scroll down so we can get We can get the 30 year. So I'm going to scroll over just so you can see that this is the 30 year return. And now we're talking about 30 years. We're down to two and a half percent. And of course, once we get into the taxes, we're lower. Uh, we're two and a quarter percent. 
and then we're just above one and a half percent return before taxes, right? So 0.2% after the taxes, that's painful. You're losing this kind of money, 900, almost, you know, getting close to a million dollars. Let's go over and look at the 40 year. Let's say this person was, you know, well, my client was, is 49, he has 500,000. What if he left it in the market? Well, <clears throat> after the 40 years, saying that the average was 7.58 and that the actual was 5.96, this is what it would be with a 1% fee. This is what it would be with the taxes. But look at the kind of money, right? You had this as what was supposed to be the real balance, right? If you went off of <clears throat> what numbers are without fees and without taxes, you were supposed to be over $5 million. And then you ended up with 2.2, you lost more than you gained. You literally gave up more, right? And so I don't know why this, I still have it like that, but let's do this. And it gets worse, right? If it's one and a half percent fee, well, look at it, it's over $3 million. You haven't even made 2 million. You don't even have 2 million left, but you've given up 3 million. So I'll go up against anybody that wants to say that I'm uh, making a lot of money, uh, commissions. Uh, that's not the conversation to have, honestly. Um, but if it, it is, if it's, honest communication, fair communication, I, I'd be happy to show you what I'm making. In fact, people that are practicing the infinite banking concept as uh, insurance agents, um, they're making considerably less uh, than what you could if you were just selling straight life insurance um, because we try to structure them to build cash, right? So, I wanted to show that over 40 years, you're at 2.83% um, after your taxes. Now, I wanna show you 2.83%, look at these numbers, write them down if you want, but 2.83% after 40 years, you're left with, um, sorry, let me scroll over a little bit. You're left with this 1.5, but I want to show something because I looked at a lot of state taxes and I can say that um, I think it's a fair um, guess kind of middle of because there's a lot to it to figure out exactly what the average would be or the, the real number. But 6% is about right for a state income tax. Um, there's 42 states in the union that have them. So I'm going to scroll back down again, just so I want to show the effect after all this time. You can, you can go back or, or go slow, but you can look. You've got 1.5 uh, million to play with, right, to stream, um, to have still exposed to those taxes. And let's see if I move this to 41%. You see, it was 2.83%, and I'm going to change this, and we're going to scroll down and see what that number is, right? It's 1.5 million and 2.83. Sorry, not going fast enough. So we've gone 2.83 to uh, 2.58. Uh, we've lost, you know, I forget what it was, it was 1.5 something, but we probably lost about, um, you know, 150,000 uh, additional dollars at least, right? Um, so with that said, um, let me show you something else. I'm gonna just change this back and... And so I want to go over to now this might seem like a lot, but of course, if it's your numbers, 
it would it would mean a lot more to you, right? So I wanted to talk about matches. And so I did really quick say, okay, we're trying, this gentleman had 500,000, but what would it take to create 500,000? Of course, 401ks, many companies will match 50% uh, of the first 6%, up to the first 6% of what you put in. And so I, I said, okay, this is what, you know, you'd have to put in at 5.96%, again, before fees and so forth, right? So if I put in this 12,879, I'd end up, you know, if I could get that rate, I'd end up with 500,000. Well, of course, if, if you have 500,000, you can see that you would have had to put in a lot more money, right? So I did that across the board, but I did it off of the, of the rate of return after fees, 4.9, 4.53. And I did it after this 20 years, because that's rough, you know, that's what it would take. You know, he's 49, for example. And so, you know, 29 is you know where we're, where we're talking um you know that he would have started for example and these are the kinds of numbers that would have had to build up so one of my prospects um as we were working through some things said to me you know i i hear i've listened to people say that you know whole life is like whole life insurance is the worst place to put your money and um you know, it's really, you know, something that people have heard, like that she did uh, from others. They don't, you know, they don't know for sure. Maybe that person didn't know for sure. But, you know, these things just keep getting passed down as if they're the gospel. Um, but in fact, you know, it could be further from the truth. Because what I did was um, a quick, let's see if I can get to it here. Um, an example of taking this, you know, let's take what actually happened over a 20 year period, right? So the rate in 20 years was 4.05%. This is before taxes. And so I said, okay, well, what would what would that actually equate to if I was able to get 4.05%? Uh, Again, let me just show you because I want to show you that this is 20 years, right? It's based off of the 20 year period, I've got it all calculated. But I took this 4% and I said, well, what if I went with the smallest amount? Now, there's a little bit of a story I want to tell here. So I said, well, why don't we start with, I'm going to take 6% of my salary and what would it take to build to 500,000? The fact is, yes, they act as if this is free money. Well, this is not free money. This match is your income. They are deferring your income. Uh, they're penalizing you if you want to take it. But honestly, people should go in and ask for this to be part of their salary. So I'm going to use an example. Try not to look at the screen necessarily. Look at my eyes. Um, let's use an example of someone offered a salary of $100,000 a year. And the company has a 401k with matching 50% uh, up to 6% of your salary. So that means they're going to give you $3,000 to put into your 401k. You should say, this is my plan. I was going to max out my 401k, but I would prefer to take that 3,000 of match is my salary. So I, I will waive the match and I'll sign off on it, but I want 103,000 in salary because this is really your income. And I'll tell you a little quick story is these uh, benefits uh, really got flourishing 
when FDR was in office, uh, World War II in the mid 40s, put a wage freeze on. And there was a little sort of loophole that they left for them was you can't raise incomes, but you can start to pay for people's health insurance and you can start paying for a pension. And that was the beginning of the, um, the private pensions, public pensions. I'm not sure about exactly when that started, but the private pensions. And then again, we, around 1980, we got into the 401ks and they just continued and they call them employee benefits, right? Well, honestly, you earned it. They're saying you're worth it, but they're carrying this thing from back in the mid 40s. It was part of a wage freeze. This is your income. You should take it. You should manage it. And that's why what I did was I said, okay, I'll take the smallest number, 12,879.32, which is my contribution and the match because that should be my money too. And then I took the 20 year with the 2% fee. And I said, well, what does that actually turn into over 20 years? Well, it turns into this number, it turns into this 385, 561 and 90 cents. So I want to show you one other thing. You can already see I'm starting to expose a little bit of it. But I have a spreadsheet that I want to show. Here it is. Okay. So this is what you call um, a life insurance, whole life insurance uh, illustration. And what I did was I made up a fictitious 29 er which is a 29 year old male um, in standard health no uh, non-smoker and i said let me put in this 12879 and i'll do it for 20 years and what does that turn into for cash value now you haven't seen these before but this is what they call there's a guaranteed side to the cash value there is a non-guaranteed which is the dividend side that they pay out um, now they're not guaranteed but this particular company has been paying, I think, uh, for 110 or 111 years straight uh, a dividend. Uh, so their goal is to, to um, have access and pay it back to the policyholders, uh, which in this case is a mutual insurance company, and the policyholders are the owners of the insurance company. So you fall short of that 385 number that I said, but now you have this $359,000. And that means that when you want to, you know, buy a car, put a down payment on a house, maybe even buy a piece of land, uh, take trips, this is your capital pool. And if you had borrowed that money from somebody, you'd have to pay it back. Well, you pay it back to the insurance company because you're borrowing against this, but this doesn't go away because you're only using it as collateral. But when you pay back the loan, if you took out a loan, you freed that collateral up again. Okay. Don't want to get stuck on all this stuff because I'm trying to cover a lot of ground. But what I wanted to show you was, okay, 20 years, you have this 359. So we're focused on this column here right? And this is based off of what's going on today. This isn't historical numbers. This is dividend paying the way they are paying them as of today, right? Okay, so I'm going to take you from year 21, because you still have premiums. Uh, we can get into why these dropped off, but the premiums do drop. They become lower just to keep this policy in place. Right. But what I what I did was I said, OK, from year 21 to year 30. OK, I put in ninety one hundred and nineteen dollars 
which is roughly $912, okay? Each year, on average, I put in 912, but look at what I have cash value in year 30. At the end of year 30, I have 549,858. And at the beginning of it, I had 359. So I took the difference between those two numbers and I came up to 190,000. Now, let me go back to the spreadsheet. So you can go back. This is the great thing about this video. You can go back and rewatch it and you can slow it down. You can calculate these numbers. You can call me. You, can, you know, I'd rather talk it over, right? But the, the fact is, these numbers are what you want to write down. You want to write this number down, then you want to write this number underneath it. You want to get what the balance, what the difference is. And then I put in this, you know, payment every year of roughly $912, the total of 9,119, right? And so I go back to the spreadsheet. What I wanted to show you was a calculation I did. I said, okay, you said that that 4.05% with that 12,879 put in would grow to this, right? And then I said, okay, well, we know what we know what this calculation is. We know that we have those other numbers in there. And I said, what would it take to get here, right? What would it take to get to this 190,000, which is what I said was the difference between those year 20 and year 30? Um, and you would literally get a rate of return compounded of 63%. Okay, that's not happening <laughs> within the stock market. Okay, so what I'm pointing out is. It's not the worst investment. But what Nelson Nash says is infinite banking concept policies are not an investment, okay? They're a capital pool. They're how you create a banking system for yourself, right? You can invest based off of your capital pool, which is created in one of these policies. Don't look at it like an investment, but when you break it down and see what really happens to your qualified plan and all these percentages and all these changes, and then you look at something like 20, year 21 through year 30, and you're making compounded interest on the additional money that you have to keep putting in, which is like roughly $912, you're making that kind of interest. That's, that's the power of this. How much money do you want to put into these policies? How big do you want your bank to be? If, if the same effort is taken uh, with a small bank to operate a small bank or a large bank, you know, which one do you want? You want the big one because this big one becomes the stream of income. It is the one financial tool that you need to actually take care of all your financing, including the, the, the forever mentioned retirement plan. This will turn into tax free and at this point, tax exempt cash flow, which will not get attached to any Social Security income so that they can get into tax and your social security that is not going to get attached to the equation that they figure out how much is your Medicare going to cost? No, you won't have any income because you paid the taxes up front, and then that money was tax exempt. I mean, that's the truth of it. My good friend, Brian Bloom, that's what he said. Now, I have some other good friends, Truth Concept Software. They have an elaborate tool that really uses Excel to they put a front end on it. 
it looks a lot crisper than this, but this is the true numbers. This is, you know, put in what you want, you'll see the power of it, and you'll be questioning, um, should I consider a different way? And so with that said, um, I want to say thank you for uh, listening. And, uh, you know, before I go, one of the things I want to say is, if you can click on the like button, if you think that this is worth anything for people to see, uh, if you would subscribe, uh, be more encouraged to you know create more videos over time. You know I'm on a mission to help expose that there is another option, and that this economic system um, is one of scarcity. Uh, one that's built on fear and it's important that we get the word out that there's other ways and so of course the way the algorithms work for people to you know have my video bubble up um, beyond just personally sharing it with each other um, is to say I like it so thumbs up please do that I I don't ask for that all the time but on this one I think it's really important and I hope you subscribe and I will continue to try to bring, um, you know, some new information. All right. And again, I hope you have a great night and uh, talk to you soon. Well, day could be day two, right? Yeah.